So in, in sort of in line with this, um, with the digital culture, um, I, I always have internet on my mind. I don't know about you, but, you know, one way or the other, either unconsciously, which is what I'd like to explore a bit, or very consciously as we, you know, in the in IN3 are paying particular attention to internet matters and, inter, you know, these various kind of connected environments. Um, Internet on my mind, you know, it's there consciously as something that I'm paying attention to, and I better do it now. I better do it now because it is so invasive that it is, it is already slipping into a semi-invisibility. I can expect our children not to have any idea about the Internet later. There is a, you know, it's, it's, it's the standard for the ground to go invisible, and the Internet is the ground, so it is going invisible. So why, what's happening, where is it going, it's, it's a bit... Uh, that's the kind of questions I'm asking myself. I deal with technopsychology. It's very pedant pedantic, but basically what it is, it's what, what's the relationship between language and the, the supporting technology. The reason being that language is very much related and formative of what we understand as our psychology. And whatever supports that language, it modifies quite in depth, in fact, certain elements of our, of our cognition, our sense of... Uh, self, even our sensorial relationship. Language be between, uh, language, uh, relation between language and mind, which then allows me to make pronostication on the relation between technology and the mind, which is basically what we're going to be doing now. So it's a bit of, it's a bunch of hypotheses, in fact, some of which can be verified by some of our experience, but not all of it is fully realized, hence, uh, <laughs> I would say, give me some slack. It's a soft determinism. Immediately I have to say, yes, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yes, I have a certain techno-determinism. In fact, it's tough determinism. In a sense, technology, because of it being so intimate, so close to our body and to our sensibility and our consciousness and so on, uh, has to be very much in part in this particular, in this particular uh, orientation of our mind, let's say. But, but it's soft to the extent that it is constantly flexible. That environment is constantly flexible. And the more you know about it, which is what McLuhan said, the better you're defended against its potential dangers, assuming that that's what you feel. Generally speaking, it's nice and useful when you do technopsychology to see what kind of changes occur in terms of time, in terms of space, and in terms of self. Yeah. So here are a few, and I might just have to go fast on this, but it gives you a sense of... Um, Three, the three great periods, the period of speech, the period of writing, and the period of electricity, which is the one we have now. What's the mode? The mode if of speech is oral uh, in the oral culture. The mind form is shared mind. People in a tribe actually share mind. What happens between them is more important than what happens in them. Well, that's an important kind of thing, and in fact, it's verified by uh, various forms of uh, ethnologies that are studying particularly Canada. I could actually give you some examples of it, but it, the idea is that mind is shared. It's not that it's uni exclusively shared. People do have a private mind, but the most important part of it is, is what is shared. On the other hand, writing. Writing brings it all into a single person, that of the private mind. And that's the private mind of the reader who silences language. The silencing of language is what allows people to think linguistically. So that, private, that privatizing of the mind is also a privatizing of the self. Whereas in the electrical era, we suddenly have a bizarre kind of extended mind, a hybrid mind, something that goes outside and connects with the screen, the screen being the interface of this extended mind. And it's hybrid because it contains my organic input, but at the same time it gives me an incredible amount of access to cognitive material, and now processed cognitive material, that is an extension of a normal mental process. You can see the social structures, collective, tribal, reticular for the speech world. The writing world brings immediately a hierarchical, vertical kind of environment, emphasizing the individual, giving the individual rights, which is not the case in other, in other social uh, connections. 
Whereas now we're dealing with social structures which are connective, lateral, uh, redistributed, disp dispersed. Whereas meaning was made by context, everything is now in the culture of the tribe. The meaning is made by the context, the context of the tribe, and you have to repeat the context in order to remember it. That that's why you have to incarnate history with your body. You can't put it outside, so you have to know everything within. And all is known by context and by repetition. Meaning is yanked out of the context and thrown all over the planet by text, because you can take text out of context. And by doing this sort of thing, reorganized context creates fiction, creates technology, in fact. Um, now we are dealing with meaning made by hypertext, which is a multiplication of the text by the context, which is an, a, an, a deepening of the context and the text, and a, a refining of it, which is where we're, we're looking at something which we can hardly describe, but it's happening. Um, Temporal and vectorial bias in the speech world, you are always dealing with the past. You have to repeat it. So you have to have a lot of practices, legends, myths. You have to, have, you have to repeat that past in order to just keep being. Whereas in the world of the text, it's always a future, the project. The world changes direction. It tells history, but it starts moving its thought towards progress, towards something that's going to change. And now, and this is very speculative, we're dealing with a very much larger present by bringing back and making accessible whatever it is that we're looking for on the internet. I know I'm exaggerating, but forget the exaggeration. Just think about the core of what I'm trying to say. What access we have now is like all history brought into now. It's really very much that, and in fact, we're getting more and more that way. So, and presentism is something that French intellectuals have already observed as an existing trend in society, so perhaps we, we, we might trust French intellectuals. But I actually feel very strongly that the internet is giving us a sense of a per permanent presence. The cell phone gives the same side of effect. So we have this kind of all at once, all, everything present. Interestingly enough, and this is where I, I, I find it uh, uh, perhaps more useful, and again, very speculative, in a speech culture, shame is the natural way of being responsible. You're responsible to the family, the clan, the tribe. So what happens, whatever you do reflects on the family, the clan, the tribe. So shame is a public thing. It's, it's, it's a responsibility not to you, but to, the, but to, the, uh, but to, the, to your community. Guilt is the appropriation of shame by somebody who is learning to read and write and internalize the consciousness and make it personal. So it's an internalizing of it, sort of writing culture, that's the sort of thing. If that's true, and I think it is true according to a fair bit of anthropological studies and, and anthropsychology, I would say, uh, uh, studies, then our question, another very speculative one, is what's, what are we responsible to now? What are we responsible to now? If we were responsible to the clan before and then responsible to the self, what is it that are we responsible to now? And I'm responding with, <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist, that ecological awareness might be just the next thing, since we're going global anyway. And being global, you have suddenly extended the responsibility towards the globe. Um, I was going to, I will get back to the spatial experience. I'd, I wish I had uh, given you some images to it. Anyway. Let's forget the spatial experience for the moment. Where do, well, here it is in some ways. Where does perspective come from? Why do we look at perspective instead of just, you know, like uh, um, the Romanesque uh, people, for example, the, Roma, uh, the Romanesque art represented the world not in perspective but in relationship of symbolic power, symbolic value. How come we suddenly decide that we want to see some kind of rational space? Well, that comes from this theory, which I will uh, use again. Uh, it's important uh, to, to, this is this, uh, this, I'd say the physiology of vision. The eyes are split in two vertical fields. It's important to know this to understand what's happening to us in terms of the uh, environment, the electronic environment. Our eyes are split vertically in two visual fields. The visual of both left visual fields is processed in the back of the right hemisphere. So the left goes like this, and on the right side, the contralateral thing. 
The vision of both right visual fields is processed in the back of the left hemisphere. The reason that's important is because there's a very strong division of labor between the hemisphere, which is that the, le the left hemisphere sort of divides the world, whereas the right hemisphere holds it. It's like holding, taking your hand to hold the bread and cut it. The hemispheres are, are distributed, or the visual um, semi-hemispheres are visually distributed so that there is an overlap between the, re the left and the right uh, visual field. Perspective then, um, this is what I just said, the perspective then comes from the uh, analysis of the visual field, the grabbing of the visual field, and its analysis in terms of the spatial distance. It's literally space suddenly being analyzed by time and splitting, in fact, space and time. And this particular relationship creates a cognitive dimension that obliges people to choose perspectivist vision and a spatial relationship that, in fact, is not existent uh, pre uh, previously that age. So it's very important to understand why a technopsychology of globality might actually open to us uh, a, a new vision of how it is to relate to the world. First, we have this huge change of scale that we all carry in our pocket by the, by, by the cell phone. We have a scale. Even, even, at, if you, even if you limit your personal scale to the furthest reach of one of your personal contacts on the cell phone, You've already, have, you, you've already have dealt with space in a way that our grandparents couldn't. It was impossible. You have now dealt with space in a forming in your own mind that's actually unavailable to any other, any other kind of cultural condition. Change of physical distribution of ourselves, of our powers, of our relationships, of our, um, um, of our or I would say even our, of the processing that we are doing, which is how we get to in cloud computing. We have a change of physical distribution, which is change of time from macro to micro scales. I'll show you an, an evolution of our notions of time. Since the beginning, we, since we started measuring time till what it is today, which is, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal. Change of self-image, of body image, of body to, I would say, the relationship to the environment has changed. So on all these levels, we have a sort of unrecognized, largely unrecognized, uh, change of sensibility. And we have what, um, what is now called global selfing by some researcher, one of which is, uh, is Irene Fast. I'll get back to her. Just wanted to point out the stage of maturation of technology. The reason I'm pointing out the technology is because I believe that if you are going to do techno-psychology, it is interesting to know at what point does the psychology come in to, uh, to, to, as a reaction to a technological change. And I feel, for example, that um, in the internet, the, the, a, moment, a very strong moment of maturation, of techno-psychological maturation, would have been Yahoo would have been what, once you had created a web, which is itself a, a beginning of maturation of the internet, then you move on to Yahoo, which is sort of a, a new burst of intelligence, and then you move on to Google, which is yet another burst of that one, and you move on to the various social networks that we, that, that we are uh, talking about now. And I think at the, the big moments must have been, must have been Yahoo and blogs, the maturing of blogs, how blogs began to create, the, blogs are the first social networks, they really are. So this kind of steps of maturation of the, of the internet interest very much. This was, I, I followed some of them. This was my computer, the uh, Osborne. I had it in, it was 1982. I brought it in France and I started to work on it. And it's a venerable, venerable machine. But just to show you in terms of like rapid maturation, this little screen <laughs> was hardly bigger than that. And um, it was a, a gray on, more or less, it was gray on gray. It was just a pale gray on dark gray. It was really hard to read and really, and you had to be, you had to be a, <laughs> an idiotic early adopter like myself to stick, stick with it. Not only to that, you had to carry the bloody thing. And it was, uh, it was you know, 25 uh, pounds or something. It was really, really heavy. But all of it, and it gave me the lights. I wrote some of, I wrote some of my best papers on it. Uh, all of it on 64Ks. 
That's all of this machine gave you Visical, gave you, which was working with CPM at the time. It gave you Visical, gave you Basic, it gave you Word, it gave you, but to write, you had to do KB and then K something else, and then you had to do KV, drop, move the thing, was just, it was. To think that we actually, to think that I had the patience of doing that. If you look back and you think about how much you put into just following some of the development of the technology, if that wasn't bad enough, look at this one. This one is ELM. Who remembers ELM? Anybody? Oh, you're way too young. ELM <laughs> was, the, was the only way you could actually do your internet. And then you would be somewhere in Venezuela, and you would be s sitting in a place where there was the only internet access, and there was a line behind you, and this stuff would take like you know, 20 minutes for, for each line. No, it was just a horrifying thing, and yet we had the patience. That was it. And then they invented Pine, which was called Pine because it was not ELM. That's all they meant. It was so, ELM was so bad that they made Pine in order to, you know, make, to make fun of ELM. Wasn't much better, by the way. But then things began to pick up speed. This is a 1983 uh, innovation. No, wait a minute, 1993. Yes, innovation, which was first in Italy, video online, which was created uh, from a company uh, in uh, Cagliari in, by uh, Niki Grauso, and that was a very innovative, and it was two megs, you had two megs per second. It was like really fast, fast line, and we were so excited about it. Um, the drawing of the, of, of the web. This is uh, another moment, an explosion of intelligence, I think, uh, on, the, on the internet. By the way, do you know that um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee and his colleague, and I keep forgetting his name, um, asked, asked the permission to have some time release in order to do the research on the web. And uh, they received a letter back from their, the head office in the European Center of uh, Nuclear Research where they were working, and they received a letter saying, uh, your project um, is vague, but it sounds, it sounds interesting. <laughs> and they gave the they gave the, uh, uh, the permission to have the time to, to create what has really done an enormous change for the world. Here's the first web. That's uh, an image of the first web. And then, of course, mosaic that makes, uh, oops, somebody wrote this wrong. A mosaic that, um, that makes the, um, that makes the a, a moment of, I'd say, maturation, maturation of the web. Linux even more. The, uh, suddenly, by allowing people to contribute to the building of the, cont of the, of the whole environment of the, of the web, you suddenly give it an enormous jump in maturity. You give it an enormous jump in interconnectivity, creativity. Uh, you can begin to see mashup in the future. There's all kinds of things that, that come along with, with uh, the, the development of Linux, which is an extraordinary thing. Then we have a succession of cognitive architectures that put themselves into place. Here is the blog, as I said, the chat, forum, muds, moves, mon, blog, social software, friends, I mean, all the Wikipedia, which is an extraordinary uh, jump into intelligence, um, and the various things that lead us all the way to Twitter. All of this, all of these are different configuration of intelligence that require an entirely different approach to intelligence than anyone we ever had, in terms of how people are, you know, uh, how they are working together, what it is that is happening. And an understanding of, of that is actually what the kids get, and they invent YouTube, and then they invent Twitter, and they invent, uh, you know, just, just get it, or, or, or air tags, or these various things that they invent. Another great moment of maturation, of course, Google Earth. So wh what's the point in all of this? I mean, where, what is really, what's, what's really happening now? If, if there is anything to all this strange technological and psychological unfolding and development, what is, what is happening? So I like this, this, this uh, uh, I like very much this, uh, slide because it gives you a sense of, of the extraordinary acceleration that happened at the beginning of the electronic era. Uh, the, these are the generations that have different cultural contexts as the one that I've described to you. Oral culture, uh, literate writing culture, printing culture, 35 generation only and imagine how much happened then. And suddenly we have, you know, 10 generation or so of, uh, of, electronic, of electronic psyche. So what we're really looking at is this common sensibility, common, call it mind, cogn cognition, memory, everything put into common that happens there that doesn't allow for a great deal of, of, uh, of innovation. It allows, though, for a very strong conservatism. Then you have these, these, these groups there that are permanent inventors. 
They never stop taking text from context and reinventing this sort of thing, accelerating considerably change, and organizing also what was a common mind, a private mind environment, dominated by private mind. So this is the one that's in terms of what I'm looking for now. What is happening here is something that is obviously going back to some of that, some of the common mind, certainly maintaining a fair bit of all the, all, the, all the things that come along with this environment of private minds, but then adding to it, and adding to it in manners which are absolutely stunning. Hypertext and random access would pre presumably favor an increased participation on the part of the nonlinear functions of the brain. That's one thing we would want to know. You know? And, if, and I feel very naive about this particular thing. This is a serious issue, this question of the uh, hemispheric r relationship. So, um, but it's one that has been sort of given too much press by uh, during, a certain, during the 70s and then sort of lost, uh, we lost ground of it. But I think it's an extremely interesting matter to, to, to uh, awaken. And I think exporting the contents of our mind to the screen and to the internet is what's happening. We're exporting whatever it is that we have in learned to include, such as personal imagination, translating text into images, that's which is what imagination is, uh, planning, sorting, uh, uh, classifying, all these, all these features that we have, designing, that we have learned to, to do in our, in our minds, we're now doing and exporting onto a screen. So that kind of relationship is itself the, as I said, the interface between, the, of the hybrid, the interface between my organic presence and my technological processing extension. So I wanted to, uh, reversing perspective is one of the examples. I'm always, I always have fun with the uh, issue of Avatar. How many of you have seen Avatar? Good, there's a lot of culture in this, in this room, that's good. Uh, Avatar, is a, uh, Avatar is the typical thing that I mean by the reversal of perspective. You remember we're talking about space and the creation of perspective where we actually have to organize space in terms of the relationship between time and space. Now, we are not looking at the world, uh, I am, in, you know, this is an old-fashioned system to have this kind of setup. But normally, I'm not looking at the world. The world is looking at me. I am now the, uh, I would say, the, the, the vanishing point. The user becomes the vanishing point of either avatar, you know, where the bullet and the projectile hits you. It comes out of the screen and, and, and hits you. If this 3D is a destiny. We, we are actually dealing with a kind of a post Baroque era, where we are re-examining our sensorial relationship and our spatial and temporal relationship with the world. So artists are, are actually very keen in exploring this sort of thing. And so uh, that's the big merit of, of, Ava of Avatar by uh, Cameron, because that's where he is very an artist. He's exploring in a very new baroque way our, our, our sensibility as we, as we are developing right now. I, I say OI, OI stands for objective imaginary. imaginary. Objective imaginary. Just look at Second Life. I know it's out of fashion and we don't need to bring it up too many times anymore, but what it means, Second Life does mean some kind of, it means Don Quixote outside his head. It means the fiction is not in, but it's out from now. And you relate to that fiction through, again, that screen and whatever interactivity you're allowed to play with it. But that sort of, that sort of externalization is an objective imaginary, because you share it with other people. Because actually people come and meet you. They're avatars, of course, your destiny. They come and meet in that uh, second uh, life environment, which makes that a, a kind of a, a consciousness that's outside your consciousness, something that you share into again, but which is very hybrid, very strange. So it's out of fashion, I think, because it's only one of the techno-psychological experiments that arise out of the out of the creativity of people, for sure, and out of the mixture of uh, insight on the part of some people or commercial uh, value. There's cloud computing is a change which is un which will I, I cannot I cannot imagine it not happening. That is entirely going to depend on a commercial interest for it to develop, but it'll have to compete with a hot, a, a, a hot <laughs> background, a very difficult uh, ob ob uh, obstacle, which I'll come back to. But cloud computing is a technological cognitive development of a very, very large importance in terms of, you know, if you think Wikipedia was good, cloud computing is going to beat it because it's something that makes a, a total sense. It, it's, it is intelligence joining memory. 
That's what it is. Oh, well, I, I'll, we'll get to that. But that's, that's, uh, that's what we... Uh, that, that's what I'm, what I'm exploring, exploring. Atto second, I was telling you about where we are in time. Here are five ways by which time is changed. Atto second is the latest in a... I'll show it to you. In the, non, in the naming of, of sizes. Of sizes in terms of, uh, in terms of time. So, so in 1600, there's a tenth of a second. It felt in 1600 that you needed to know the tenth of a second. Just imagine that, because that's exactly what's happening to us. We, are, we need to know the time of an atto second. In 1800, they felt, oh, no, no tenth of a second, that's not enough. Let's, let's measure down to the hundredth of a second. Then, you know, just 50 years later, no, no, we need a millisecond now. Oh, God, what are you doing? Then in the 1950, the microsecond. And then 1965, the nanos. We, we've, you know, we're the... Our kids was already the nano generation, right? The nano kids, because they live at the nanosecond. They want the bloody thing to be real time, and they get mad if it isn't. So that's what the nanosecond is all about. The picosecond in 70, five years later. Then the femtosecond, we, have, we now have femtocells. Have you heard about femtocells for cell phones? They're we're going to play with those. Femtocells, femtocells. They are dealing with femtos. So very soon, <laughs> you, you're going to need to know what's the speed of a lateral side ray on a laser, a lateral side flash on a laser. How long does it last? Well, it lasts 600 attoseconds. That's what, at least what science tells us. So now we're living at the speed of, of attosecond. And I think it's really very important to recognize that as we divide time to that extent, you know, are we Zeno's arrow that never reaches its end, uh, forever dividable? As we, you know, we, we see time in an entirely different fashion, it's worth looking at how it is relates to measurement. And also, why did we have to invent real time? It wasn't time good enough? I mean, real time is an invention which is totally recent. We didn't need real time last, uh, you know, century. At the most of it, anyway. So suddenly real time becomes something. And then, of course, once you've invented real time, you've got to consider extended real time, which is what happens on, you know, your work, the work of the uh, work of, of, of students which, who are working in teams and they are collaborating on some project. That's an extended real time, which happens only because of the possibility of sustaining and archiving all the contents of a conversation. And what we're seeing, too, and that's a little bit more complicated, it's a reunification of space and time. As kind of, you know, since, since relativity, we've been talking about the space-time continuum as, as, a, as a single environment, a, mub a mubia strip, you would say, of, of, uh, of, of let's call it physics. Uh, but, but, but that actually is something which uh, traditional cultures always had. It was always, the, it was natural to, uh, in, in particularly in Japan, for example, it was absolutely natural for Japanese people to consider space and time as, the, as one and the same, you know a united environment. We split it. Having split it, now we, now we bring it back together again through physics, you know, through the quantum physics, for example. So we are feeling very strongly in a kind of very different moment, a different, I would say, uh, certainly a hugely different moment in, uh, in consciousness. And I call that moment the post-Galilean moment because Galileo was the <laughs> he wasn't responsible, but he was the, the, the person with whom we associate the firming up of matter the, and the trustworthiness of science and of science in all its paradigmatic changes. Galileo is, what f is, the, is the symbol of that part of the culture that firmed up the environment. And now we have people like Einstein but and some quantum theories to tell us that in fact there's absolutely nothing firm of any kind. There's not even anything necessary, let alone just firm like material stuff in quantum dimensions. Not even necessary. In other words, could be willed and are being willed in some fashion. I'm not, I know I'm pushing it here, but the point is the post-Galilean means what Zygmunt Bauman described as flow what Manuel Castell described as flow, what anybody who today studies how things are going described as flow. It's a flowing of not only people, goods, and services. Is there a problem? Uh-oh, I'm sorry. I've got, I've got what it takes. Just, just relax. Uh, I'll be back <laughs> with, with some more. Uh, if you're still interested. What time have I got, anyway? 27. You think I should uh, 
No, we have time. We have plenty of time. So yeah, we're still talking about time. So yeah, the post-Galilean moment um, is the moment that everything that sounded solid is now turning to fluid and turning into labile and, and, and friable and, and, and retransmutable, the, a whole world of remix. So space, reversal of perspective, now you enter into the world instead of, you know, instead of looking at and putting back from it. In virtual reality, you, you put yourself into the world and suddenly your visual sense is now uh, informed by your tactile sense in a way which you had sort of, you know, not gotten used to. Your body movement is what actually creates a relationship to space. So it's a tactile dimension that actually joins the visual kind of control we normally have. The user is the vanishing point. Whether in avatar the film or whether in information environment, the information is focusing right into you. You are the vanishing point as you are into uh, or either one of those video games or into some kind of 3D environment. But beyond the 3D environment, I would say the metaphor goes beyond that. I think that somehow uh, you become the portal or the entrance a gateway, in fact, to whatever happens, to this uh, huge environment that is building itself. I talked about hybridity, the blurring of boundaries between what is cognitive, organic, and cognitive technical. I mean, we can always separate them, for sure, but in, f in many, many fashions, they are intertwined uh, in, uh, in, in an extremely intimate way. Expansion to the global scale, scale. The mental geography, I don't, you know, I sometimes ask my students, I, I'm going to ask you, uh, how many of you frequently represent the earth in your mind. Frequently, I mean at least once a month. Otherwise, no. Well, you, you still have, we, we, we have a long way to go, I understand. But I think eventually the, um, the integration, because of Google Earth, largely because of Google Earth, but not exclusively, since we've seen the earth from the moon, the actual <laughs> Its representational potential is increasingly that of a unified entity, as opposed to just my, my, my own area, my own, my own backyard. But there again, I told you, I am speculative about this sort of thing. I believe that e an ecological reality is going to be the next responsibility simply because it is, a global, it's, it is a global response and it's one that respects exactly the kind of thing that responsibilities are made for. I think that's going to happen. So eventually, um, I don't know. Um, here's an example. Why do you think Europe turned, became a continent? I mean, people were killing each other not long ago and suddenly it becomes a single continent. Well, this is a really good question. Why are you saying that's, that can happen? How can you possibly imagine all these Gauls and these other people suddenly getting together and saying, well, we're going to get mad at each other, but it'll be in Strasbourg and in Brussels? You know, that's total news. So how did that happen? Just politics? Certainly not. Just economics? Absolutely not. It would take a lot more than just politics and economics to change a status of a situation where nationalism is so strong. Just watch the football games. So how did that happen? It happens because, and I believe it's a, it's a satellite effect, it happens because the weather report at night show you Europe and did so for a long time before it suddenly happened that Europe could be, but it showed you Europe. It didn't just show your area. And it showed you Europe in real time with satellite, more and more satellite images actually describing it. These continental things are the reflection of a unified vision that comes from a satellite and it happens because the satellite takes care of where humans can live, which is within the limits of <laughs> earthbound. In the sea, no. But these earthbound create then you know, you could say it's Mr. Orwell being all, uh, all, you know, right again, saying, yes, we have Eurasia here and we are doing this. No, I think it's continentalism. Continentalism is the, is, is the necessary step towards globalism, towards an, a, a situation where globally we feel as well and as comfortable, and I have to say it is comfortable in terms of political system, as we do in Europe. That's something that's, uh, that's, that is going to be part of this kind of, change of environment. So anyway, I'm pushing the, I'm pushing the, uh, the issue of, of uh, uh, 
geographical representation of the planet as one avenue by which one can possibly recognize uh, something on the way. I'm sure there are many other signs that I have, that, that have, uh, that I have, not, uh, that I have not been able to pay attention to, but as soon as I do, I'll tell you because it's, uh, it's valuable. So the return of acoustic space, I'll get back to that. Um, it's, a, it's a McLuhan thing that um, we're back into acoustic space. What McLuhan meant by that was that we were back into a situation where everything was sudden and coming from everywhere. And in, in total surround, the total surround of information. We are ba bathed in it. We still have a frontal, we have a lot of frontal, you know, obviously we have to live frontally, but to live frontally and have a dorsal consciousness is something that is also developing in a way that comes from the fact that we're in the total surround. Total surround of information, total surround of... We're in the middle of it. So that's what he meant by acoustic space. Acoustic space is the space that's created by sound that is everywhere at once. That's, uh, and from where anything can occur anytime at any moment. Suddenness, the world of the, the sudden. And, we are, and, and in fact, it's true. It's this kind of, in the presentism I was talking about, we're, we're arriving to this sort of, this sort of uh, everything is sudden. At the same time as the continuity of the present gives us confidence that we're ready for whatever sudden. Self, context, in the context world is shared. Responsibility to the clan, I said that. Just to keep track of time, it's fine, yeah. Um, I've, I've talked about the shame, uh, responsibility to myself, the guilt, and eventually the responsibility to the ecology. But the problem, and this is where I find interesting, in relationship we have augmented proximity and new kinds of intimacy. We have, we're, we're relating to each other now through SMS and Skype and, uh, of course, Internet and all these various media, which actually train, change considerably the kinds of availability we, availability we have to each other and the kinds of... Um, mm, uh, so in fact, the sensibility we develop around the use of whether it's YouTube or whether it is Skype or whether it's, we have different kind of mental and social and emotional habits that are, that are, that are developing out of that. Um, and I, my own experience in, in, uh, in Skype has been uh, absolutely amazing because, not so much because the image was so good, I, I have to admit, I have to admit that I was very much also an early adopter in the issue of video conferencing. I have developed a passion for video conferencing in the very early 90s because I saw artists use it in a, mo in a most extraordinary fashion, allowing people to see each other across the Atlantic, which was something an enormous emotion for me, and I thought it was an extraordinary thing that one could do this sort of thing. And I never, never realized then that, of course, <laughs> we'd be doing it for free every day. My first experience, I had many, and they were all disastrous. Uh, one of them was called Communicatus Interruptus. You can imagine, I lost, I lost the line between, uh, between Canada and France, and uh, like after 35 seconds of, or 45 seconds of, of a show, which was supposed to last an hour and a half. Awful, 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 awful. The thing that I am going through, I mean, the fact that I went through all of this and to, to arrive at a situation where all of that has matured, and we're really talking about maturing, is absolutely amazing. But I've had, um, I've, I, I've had the experiences, which were, thanks to uh, Skype, absolutely fascinating, of I was in Washington having having preparing dinner, and for some reason I turned on Skype, and it was a fireplace, and the fire in the fireplace was wonderful. I turned on Skype, and somebody, uh, a friend from Rome who happened not to sleep, decided to chip in and said, hi, Derek, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm making dinner. And we started talking as if he was in the room, and because of the fireplace, what's happened? Did I lose it again? Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. But anyway, I said, because we were, because we were, um, uh, because we were talking in a way that made absolute sort of normal sense, I felt that the extended living room actually really was, really was happening. The fireside chat of, uh, uh, what was it, uh, the, pre the President of the United States who did the fireside chat, wasn't that uh, uh, da, 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 Roosevelt? I think it was Roosevelt. It, it could have done that. Anyway, the idea that television would allow people to sit by the fire with the President of the United States actually never was, came close to the feeling of you, that you had by having a real-time conversation with somebody at the other side of the Atlantic sitting at the, uh, sitting at the sorry about this, I have to, to re reopen it. Um, so in, in the, there it is, augmented new kind of, uh, new kind of uh, intimacy, um, 
I just have. Yeah, I just wanted to explore a little bit what would happen. And this is really exploring. It's just a question I'm asking myself. But what happens when we distribute ourselves in these various media, and we have avatars, and we have. Uh, 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 what you call these um, proxies, and we have all kinds of all kinds of extensions of ourselves, uh, including a digital persona, which is the assembled data that might be assembled if they are, but at least the assembled data that are existing in various databases about yourself. So that's a digital reality. What is the notion of self that when we can expect from from our present situation? So I'm here. I am uh, going to read to you a very beautiful paper, uh, piece by uh, Hopkins about self, how he feels about self. This is a self educated by literacy, right? Uh, private self. When I consider myself being my consciousness and feeling of myself and taste that taste of myself, of I and me above and in all things, which is more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum, more distinctive than the smell of a walnut leaf or camphor, and is incommunicable by any means to another man, as when I was a child, I used to ask myself, what must it be to somebody to be someone else? Nothing else in nature comes near this unspeakable stress of speech, distinctiveness, and selving, this self-being of my own. Nothing explains it or resembles it, except so far as this, that other men to themselves have the same feeling. It's a very interesting and uh, articulate notion of some kind of perception that one has of oneself and for oneself. And on that, this, uh, this researcher, Irene Fast, has uh, explored the idea of selving, the idea that we are not a self so much as something in, 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 in construction, permanent construction. Our perceiving, thinking, feeling, and acting are not what our self does, rather they are what our self is. It's an interesting change. The idea being that the self is some homunculus controlling the rest. No, it's, it's what it is. What are the development and clinical consequences of thinking of ourselves of not having a self, but as doing self things, as selving? This is all prelude to actually e-selving, which is what is happening to us as we extend ourselves online. The basic unit of the dynamic I-self, or selving, is a scheme of personally motivated interaction between self and non-self. That's what she calls an I-scheme. And this is a notion which comprehends development and development failure as a product of integration and differentiation among discrete I schemes. And then she de develops this by several questions. What sort of self is this E self? Varieties of connected selves. How does E selfing expand the literate self, the, the, the self from the alphabetic self, I would, I would call it? How does the mind of the selfing work? What is selfing without a sense of I ness, which is the selfing of our digital persona. What are the dangers and pitfalls awaiting selfings? So anyway, um, these are questions I have left mostly unanswered. Uh, what I have found, uh, the, the very limited stuff that I have found is um, what you see here. First of all, that we are emphasizing what I call the hypertextual mind. We're emphasizing um, the rapid, fluid combination of things which at first that didn't, seem to, didn't seem to connect or mean, but the a much more flexible access to ver a variety of sources, which comes from the fact that we are using hypertext in a way that is, you know, practically. We are, we're dealing mentally very much more in the way that we are dealing with the, uh, w with the technology. Moving from linear, literally a linear way of searching, a linear way of access, a linear reading, hopping from a bit of information to another one, snapping bits and pieces, putting them together. Uh, distributed cognition, which is a concept that is, have, has been developed uh, over the last 20 years in the United States, is about how our minds actually are not limited to the individual that actually are distributed within an environment in order for people to just simply perform a simple, uh, simple operation. Hence, you have to include in the mental, con in the mental analysis, you have to include its context. Uh, rapidly collective versus connective intelligence. You may have all heard about collective intelligence, which uh, means that we are developing over long periods of time uh, in uh, 
collective exchanges that eventually end up with innovations and end up with uh, improving or not the fate of, the, of, of people. It's viewed as collective by Pierre Lévy. I find it much more important to, to emphasize connective intelligence, which is the individual types of intelligence that are actually interconnect in very specific kinds of networks and very, a, a, a need for a grammar of networks to talk about what intelligence really is becoming. And then going beyond intelligence too, actually emotions, because we are more and more interested in that, more and more you know, uh, interested in how, how that is distributed. Um, and then, of course, cloud computing becoming uh, memory plus intelligence. And I call this my, my mind in Internet because, you know, <laughs> I was saying the Internet on my mind, but now it's the, it's the reverse. I have my mind in Internet, and it's being supported by all these things. This is a... Um, this, is my, this is my vision. Um, no, it's not my <laughs> vision. This is actually a, um, a representation of... Uh, patterns of movements um, in the brain, and it looks like, a, uh, like something which w very woolly, but it's really my entrance to what I believe is one of the most beautiful sites and the most intelligent and the most interesting sites that, uh, I have, that I have seen, if the connection works. It takes a bit of time. It's called visual complexity. Did you ever, s anybody saw visual complexity? There is one who has. Well, I don't, it's not a present to you then. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but uh, it's a present to everybody else. It really is magnificent. Uh, it's a, a magnificent site, and it, it, it talks exactly about the hypertextual intelligence, uh, the pattern recognition intelligence. Uh, all of these, all of these uh, different uh, icons you see there, are actually gateways to a different visualization of different data. Some of them extremely pertinent, others less so. Some of them artistic, but most of them, and you can see the, the, the uh, fabulous categories here, based on art here, biology, business networks, computer system, food webs, internet, knowledge networks, um, political networks, pattern recognition. Basically, that's what I mean by intelligence. That's what I mean by when you put data together and reconnect it and actually represent it so that people can make use of it, that's actually a sort of an intelligent product. Product. This is not static, but it is an intelligent, but, and it, it's also a process. But what's happening with, with uh, the future of the internet is that it becomes, it moves from the intelligent product to intelligent process and intelligent processing. And in fact, it, even in such in many of the cases here, it is because you can do real-time simulation uh, coming out from, uh, I think I have one or two that I have, uh, that I have sorted out. Uh, but, you know, just, just this one is quite, quite I, you know, I, I'm as sensible to eye candy as anybody else, but I think this is a rather pretty one. This is called Ride the Byte, and Ride the Byte was developed by this group. Um, no, they don't say it. It's, it's, uh, some of these things are actually un unknown. Developed to make the normally invisible structure of the internet transparent to the general public and allow people to see the path taken by data pack transmitted via the internet. This electronic representation also visualized the flow of information to selected websites in the form of simulated journey across a virtual real reality globe. So, I mean, that's, that's just one example. And if I went there, but we don't really have time for that, we could just probably see what's going on in uh, semi-real time. Or what I call, what I call... Um, mm, ob ob objective, I forgot, the, I forgot the name I gave it. It's, it's not objective imagination. Uh, when you have data that comes from frequency analysis of the occurrence of anything, I don't know if you ever saw World Clock. Here's another present for you. World Clock is a beautiful site that allows you to see by day, by month, by week, by month, by year, by decade, the production of cars, this, the occurrence of cancers, the uh, mm, relative quantities of babies born at the time. And, and so you, you sort of see it, and you see these numbers run, roll in, in front of your eyes. I mean, I could, I could go there and show you. You see these numbers roll in front of your eyes, and you think, oh my goodness, I mean, how did they know this? Well, how do they know this is because by tabulating, using computer, as exact as you can, a uh, close representation of what the real thing really is. So it's a kind of 
objective reality of, of a new kind. So it's a hybrid between the real and the completely fabricated, the completely simulated. It's a very interesting hybrid, that particular, that particular idea. So all of these things, all the, um, come back to the, uh, to the presentation, all of these things represent different approaches to different data environment for different purposes coming out from an infinity of contributors, and which, is, uh, which, is the, which is a very strong, uh, uh, there we go back to the, uh, a, ver a very strong example of this, of this distributed cognition um, distributed cognition refers to a process in which cognitive resources are shared socially in order to extend individual cognitive resources or to accomplish something that an individual agent could not achieve alone. That's a simple definition. Human cognitive achievements are based on a process in which an agent's cognitive processes and the objects and constraints of the world reciprocally, reciprocally affect each other. Cognitive processes can be distributed between humans and machines, physically distributed cognition, um, or between cognitive agents, uh, socially distributed cognition, and Solomon pointed out that distributed cognition forms a system that consists of an individual agent, his or her peers, teachers, and a social culturally formed cognitive tools. It's an entirely different way of looking at how cognition, uh, cognition functions. Uh, and it is something that is uh, germane, and I think in fact inspired. It's, it's just like hypertextual mental strategies are selected by the technologies that we are dominantly using, whether it's our cell phone or any kind of internet connection, we have a situation where the emphasis of a specific thing that has always existed suddenly is you know, thrown into us uh, by, by the technological environment. Hence, just as the internet may be responsible for rave music, it may be responsible for the understanding of distributed cognition. That's what I'm trying to say. It, it, it emphasizes different kind of thing. I know I'm putting you, a, I'm throwing you a line by the rave music. The internet is the, uh, is the moment when rave music begins. It is that which responds to a very, very high speed. Very, it's when the culture is accelerated to an extremely high speed, the kids have to dance faster. And rave came along with the internet. That's, that's, the, that's the kind of thing I'm saying. The, the technology kind of spread itself in different kind of configuration. And so distributed cognition or rave are consequences which have nothing to do with each other except that they both belong to that particular sensibility. Um, connected intelligence, I don't have to go on to this, but when you go, if I clicked into that, you would see a list of different kind of designs that allow you different ways of analyzing what's happening on Twitter at any moment at the time that you are, you know, you're getting into this. Now that's an astounding thing, having access to a cognitive process of hundreds of thousands of people in particular contexts and seeing it happen right in front of your eyes. That's got to inspire an entirely different way of understanding intelligence. So that's an example, and here's somebody who predicted it. Uh, maybe I should, no, we have time, we have time. I, sh I, will, I will conclude uh, fairly soon, but I love this because that's, that's where we are now. The next medium, it's connected intelligence. The next medium, whatever it is, it may be the extension of consciousness, and it's certainly that, will include television as its content, not as its environment. It'll transform television into an art form. YouTube, anyone? That's TV transformed into an art form. That's a prediction of 1962. Amazing as it is. But that's nothing. Next one. A computer as a research and communication instrument could enhance retrieval, well, we know that, obsolescent mass library organization. Where did he get that? How did he get, how did he double guess that one? That's an amazing prediction because that's tags. Obsolescent my, lives, mass library organization comes from the need of putting everything into categories and plans and places and have its place and, you know, tags, you don't need it. You interconnect immediately one thing to another. So having talked about obsolescent mass library organization and then the, even better, retrieve the individual's encyclopedic function. Hello. That's your encyclopedic function. Anybody who contributes or even doesn't, just, just, just by reading, by using it, and God knows we do, by using Wikipedia, we're actually playing our encyclopedic knowledge. So retrieve the individuals. I have no idea where he got that. I really don't. No idea. Because there was no evidence of that anywhere close when he was writing in the 62. 
So, uh, and flip, this, this is banal again, flip into a private line to speedily tailor data of a saleable kind. In other words, an economy. Really, the prediction here is absolutely astounding. Um, there must have been something, yes, but that's going to be long downloading, so we're going to skip. The use of these things, yes, for, uh, for, for this, is, this is the kind of what I would talk about, the environmental once we simulate, we assimilate. Once we simulate, we integrate it, we absorb it into our own sensibility. So an idea of seeing the danger signs of the planet, which is what you see here, and you can see that happening in front of you too, is a kind of projection that actually creates a consciousness that, that relates to what I was talking about before in the ecological responsibility. Communication of moods via social network. Very interestingly, that there is a study that actually says that in, um, the com there is a communication of mood within a social network that goes beyond the, the edges, so-called, of the network. That actually, you know what edges are, the, edge, the extension of the, the, the farthest reach, the more isolated farthest spindles or reaches of your network in terms of how they are connected with other people. Well, even at those very far edges, you find that the mood, moods can be communicated. Uh, coming from a news, coming from, but it could be even a, a family mood that has nothing to do with the people out there on the edge. So it's strange that, that, that the network is now, for, is, is now perceived as an emotional communication device. It's important to, to, to keep that in mind. An artist represents this. This is, a, this is an artist's use of network data in order to, to represent this kind of emotional dimension. So I'll conclude on cloud computing. Why do I think cloud computing is so uh, critical, even though it's just a mere more mature, it's, it's the, it seems to be the next step in the maturation of the technological environment that I have shown you from the beginning. Um, it's not the latest uh, in software, it's not, it's what it is, it's a, a very strong new concept, even though it's been around for a while. It's not as we didn't hear about cloud computing 10 years ago. But as now something that is coming into realization, what it is, is if we are putting our memory in common outside, as we have done with the Internet so far, sometime at a price, most time not. Most of it free, so hence that difference. I know the price issue is going to always be, and the access issue is always going to be there. But the point is, for all intents and purposes, there's a lot of information out there that's entirely for free. So it's, our, it's this enormous collective memory that we have made available in this third space, the space, the digital space, not cyberspace, but it's just that, you know, made of digital uh, format space. Uh, having put this memory out there, then putting, putting the intelligence as well, putting the processing as well. What is cloud computing? Do you know? I mean, Yes, you, I'm sure that people, but anyway, just, to, just for those who don't, cloud computing is actually having all the programming done for you from the internet and not anymore in your machine. In other words, in very simple economic terms, you don't have to buy a whole lot of heavy duty, expensive and quickly outmoded software. You have a company that does it for you and gives you access to all the software you possibly need, constantly updated and constantly available. Whether it's going to, how, how it is priced, and there are companies now which are beginning to do it. How it is managed, this is still very much in, 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 the, in the works, but it's already functioning and it will probably continue to function even more so. So what I find absolutely fascinating, what it is, is that all of these things, they say here, everything in the kitchen sink, I mean, PC, mobile, code, uh, application server, all database, all of that, instead of being processed into your machine, is actually processed for you into the air, so no need for huge processing power either. You know, the 32 gigabytes and then the 64 gigabytes and then the petabyte and all the stuff. No, maybe not. Maybe we will need just the basics uh, to process the stuff that are to receive their end of, of the stuff processed there. So access to the network. Um, and this is, what I, this is what I really found interesting about what's going on now. If we, as I said, if we are in a hybrid situation, and we seem to be, uh, and we are going global, a cloud computing becomes the maturation moment, the maturation moment, the moment when this cognitive environment suddenly becomes integrated 
suddenly integrates itself. It, these moments of integration happen all the time. Yahoo was a moment of integration. Blog was a moment of integration. But the moment, the big moment of integration now would be allowing people to have access to the most sophisticated uh, software capabilities of whatever it is they want, whether it's for rendering images or music or whether it's for dealing. In fact, they already have access to so much of this in any case. Uh, but having that access in a way that makes this much, much more democratic, much more uh, you know, diffused, distributed, you have distributed intelligence as well as distributing memory. This could be it. We're back into acoustic space. There we are. That's what McLuhan, McLuhan said. Back into acoustic space, meaning everything accessible, totally ubiquity. But everything sudden, everything happening right, right now. He has a definition. The key characteristic of acoustic space is that it engages multiple senses at the same time. It does not demand that objects be dissected to be understood. Rather, the multiple parts coexist simultaneously. To understand acoustic space, you must perceive all of it, not focus on one part. In other words, acoustic space demands that you apprehend figure and ground simultaneously and that the senses work together. That is exactly what it is somehow required from, from uh, uh, the sensibility that's, that's developing right now. I mean, people have stopped smoking. It's very interesting. That's the general idea of actually moving into an entirely different sensorial environment. Smoking was separating the head from the body. Now they want the body and the head together again. So it's a very typical type of thing. It's, uh, it takes a while. I mean, you know, we're talking about a period of 20, 20, 30 years to the uh, stopping of smoking, and it's not going to happen at the same time in the same place everywhere, but basically it's that type of thing that, are, that that's an example of, of, of the change of sensorial environment that we are living into. Another one is one I, what I call the point of being, and the point of being is the response to the point of view of the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, we're invited to take a point of view to look at the world, and that's the, the development perspective. And um, hence, we are always separating ourselves from the view, separating ourselves from the world, imagining the space as neutral between ourselves. But in fact, in a point of being, it's the reverse. In a point of being, you actually feel space. You know it's not neutral, and you negotiate, you dance in it, as opposed to the point of view, where you just paint. And so I think that's, that may be one of the sensibility changes that, will, that we can expect, that we can expect, along with a whole lot of things that I haven't been able to explain, <laughs> either because I don't know them or because I didn't have time or didn't get back into my mind to talk about. But I think it's, it, that's what I'm after in internet on my mind, is understanding What's happening? <laughs> What's happening to my mind? Uh, 